Hello, welcome. Oh. There's Ben and Gail. You. Yeah. Hello. Hello. <laughs> Good to see you. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. Lisa Orselli is here. Uh, Gary. Yeah, we're going to introduce the artists in just a minute when everybody gets signed on here. Lisa Orselli, hello. Hi. Gary. Um, I'm sorry, I just walked into the room, so are you just saying who you are? And no, no, I'm just commenting on your background. It's very nice. Oh, <laughs> okay. Free advertising. <laughs> Penelope is here. Hi, Penelope. Great to see you. Mm. Hello, Edmund. Good hello, to see Hi. you. Hello, Hi. And hello, everyone else. I don't think I've met anyone else on there yet. All right. I want to introduce uh, Lisa Pressman. Uh, Lisa and, and Susan really complement one another and work together frequently. I find that there, uh, you know, these processes that sound uh, daunting are all very uh, learnable and adding to your toolbox as an artist is, is always fun. Um, but I think we're gonna learn about some uh, hot and cold wax processes. So let's introduce, let's, uh, Okay. Spotlight, Let's, Lisa. All right. Um, so, Sue, wave your hand. Um, <laughs> Sue and I have been uh, colleagues, friends, and have been teaching together for about two years. Um, both of us work with encaustic, which is hot wax, but that will not be something that we can bring to Italy, unfortunately. Um, if you want to know about that process, we can do something, you know, what we are going to bring is our ideas about travel and how travel can be a source yeah. for inspiration. Um, so we, we've talked, actually Sue has had a, um, on her own business, two artists that travel. Um, so she, she'll tell you about where she's been. And I've taken groups to Italy and France and Mexico. Um, and basically what I do is, and what we will do is we, we like to bring a lot of water media and other materials and, um, and play around and also use the time, let's say if we're going on trips or traveling, we have assignments. So, you know, maybe it'll be take as many pictures as how many blues can you find? And then the next day, as we come back into the studio, we would use that in terms of prompts or exercises. So I'm just going to show you my desk. It's going to be completely messy as opposed to Sue's hands, which is really <laughs> neat. That's our, one of our, it's kind of our thing. <laughs> yes. I'm all over the place and she's really good and organized. So um, what I thought I would show you, first of all, is uh, when I went to Italy, oh, I don't remember it was when it was. This is a pastel book um, that I love because it has, you can use pastels, which are soft, and it has this paper in between. And so what I did was just, you know, when we were in the studio, I did sketches and color studies. I missed some paper. Um, you know, definitely there were a lot of doors. There were a lot of windows. I was in uh, Portona. Um, just show you. So these would be some of the things that I might do with soft pastels just wanted to get to the color. You know, here's the colors. Um, and I just used paper and then I pasted them in here so I could travel with them. So that, that would be something that we would use. And then the other one um, is 
um, what are they called? Oil pastels. And so this is another really easy book to travel with, to do small studies with. And then I'm just showing you some supports. You know, everyone loves to have their, their nice sketchbook. Of course, I only did, a, I've only done a few little things in there. Um, the workhorse is Stonehenge paper because you can do almost anything on it. Um, it's pretty rough and tug it, rough and tough. And then Arches oil paper. So um, I guess I'll start out with just saying that um, I'll go through the, weed, the water media, but what you might find interesting are these RNF pigment sticks. So RNF is a company um, in Kingston, New York, and they make these sticks. Um, they are oil paint. They're oil paint with a little bit of wax and a lot of pigment. Um, th they're, they're juicy and delicious. They come opa in opaque colors and transparent colors. There's about 104 colors. Um, Sue and I both represent, um, we're core instructors for RNF. So both of us will have suitcases packed with these to put on the plane. <laughs> yeah. So that, that'll, that will be a fun thing. And basically most of um, my oil work, you know, I work on Arches oil paper or you can, um, you can prep paper with oil, uh, acrylic paint or gesso but I'll just show you a few little things that this does. So this is a beautiful color right here. Um, they come in these tubes, by the way, um, I threw them out, but you have to take them out of the tubes, otherwise you can never get them back in. And they, they also have a little skin that dries. So I never waste anything, so I'll keep that. Actually, I'll start with that and I'll just wipe that down here. And as you can see, it's just this beautiful, transparent, glowing color. You can make um, uh, washes and atmosphere with them. They come with a blender stick, which is just wax and um, linseed oil. So I can thin this down to get a, a beautiful glaze. And then what else is fun is they, they also come in an opaque color and you can draw with them. So you can make expressive drawing lines with them like this. Um, the only caveat about them is they're oil paint. So they don't dry so quick. So when I've traveled with these, um, I have brought a little cold wax or we use the blender. Um, we use a lot of tissue paper to sop up some of the oil. And then when you bring them home, you know, we wrap them in glassine um, if you're traveling from somewhere else. And, you know, I can just go in there and mix it. Uh, one of the most fun things is to add tissue paper. Um, I'm actually going to just take a piece of this paper, is to do some mono prints with them. They're great for, uh, let's say we were going to go out somewhere, you know, in the field. They, you know, if it gets a little too hot, they melt. But, you know, if you wanted to do some interesting landscape, but you can also do some printmaking with it, which is really fun. Um, I use these. Um, I'm, a, I'm a material girl which means I'll use whatever I can get my hands at on whenever, even if it's not, you're not supposed to. But um, so for instance, this is called Art Graph and Art Craft comes in these beautiful colors. Uh, there's a bunch of them and they are great for drawing with. So even with this oil paint, I could come in and make a mark or just throw that over there on my stone hedge. I can use this as um, 
you can use like just water and go in there and just get a beautiful painted water line. Or I can go in and get this sort of, you know, sharp line and then I could go in and wet it a bit. I really like wetting the paper first and then going in. And you can see this color here. So again, these are called art graph. Um, for any of you who work with encaustic or cold wax, they do work on um, waxy materials, which is, people are always looking for that. And again, it takes on sort of a watercolor ink quality to it. And so then, so I'm the kind of person, I walk into an art supply store, I bring a painting in and I try all the open stock. So like this, this is a Derwent watercolor, Derwent, D-E-R, D-E-W, I'm sorry, D-E-R-W-E-N-T. Um, they make a lot of water sol soluble materials and they make these things called ink tents. They come as a pencil and they also come in bricks. And that, those colors are really intense. I only have the black one here, but these, the Derwitt pencils are also, you can use them dry and then you can use them with a brush and wet them down. So, um, sort of a lot of dry, um, water soluble drawing materials. Um, the other thing, so here, here I like Richardson pa pa uh, soft pastels. That's what these are. I mean, um, they're just really, they're rich and they're intensely colored. Whew. And then I also use these, which are pan pastels, which come in these little containers, which you can actually lay down with a sponge and layer color with them. And with, with these, I have no problems thinking to myself, I'm gonna take this lender stick and see what that does with the pan, with the pa soft pastel. Because I kind of like the way it some of it looks wet. So I'm a combiner, like to combine some stuff. Um, and then I might even like say, oh, I've got this walnut ink. And maybe I'll just come in and do a little splatter. And because of the wax, I'll, I'll hold this up. You can see that it just sits, right? So you can get some interesting things that go on on top. And of course, if there's, if you have some tissue paper, which I thought I had, I do. Um, I can blot that some. and it changes it up a little bit. So I'll combine um, these oil sticks. Oil sticks are, are oil pastels are way different than this. These are oil, but they have a non-dryer. So they never dry, they have to go under glass. They, they're fun and they layer up. Um, I used to always do a lot of drawings with these, but again, these are oil paint. So for any of you who are oil painters and have never used these, you're in for a treat because they are really delicious. A um, couple of other things. I'm an ink, I, I just love ink and I discovered this company. It's called, um, and they're not paying for me to say this, um, Birmingham Pen Company. So they're, they're in, uh, where are they? I think they're in Pennsylvania. And I, I actually just saw them on, it was an Instagram sale in about 20 seconds when I saw the color. Um, I don't know if they're light fast, but they make these beautiful, I mean, look at the color of this ink. So I, I mean, I could just do a whole, 
Actually, I will show you, I have a couple pieces that I've been using this ink on. This is called arugula. I think they have now 30 or 40 colors. Um, they're, just, they're just really beautiful in the color department. Um, uh, what else? A uh, couple other things, you know, I love an eraser. So I know it's like a what, an eraser. So I'm, I'm a big on giving prompts, things like, you know, make a black drawing. And these are like warm ups and things to get you thinking about your own personal language um, and different ways to get marks. Cause that's something that I, I use in my work. And then, you know, then use the eraser and see what you can get from the eraser and then take the eraser and come somewhere else over here and see what it does with the wet. And make some marks with the eraser. And then um, one of my, you know, I love layers. So, uh, I've been using this acrylic paint actually with the water media, it's titanium buff. So actually it's pretty stuck. So I'm just gonna put some down. Um, so I might just put this on and cover this all up. Um, these brushes are silver line brushes, they're mop brushes. And so I'm just gonna go on top of this and kind of put it in back in space a bit and then Maybe I will come in and use one of my water pencils and come back in. And you know what? Let's try this too. So I, I'm dem demonstrating, you know, abstraction here, which is kind of, you know, what my work addresses, but. I, I have mentored and taught representational um, painters because to me, it's, it's the same language. You turn your, your house upside down, you're still dealing with shape and form and color and all that stuff. So I'm gonna put that over here. And then I just um, prepped a piece with a little acrylic on top and um, thought maybe I would try this color on here. It's just water that I'm using, obviously. Yeah, so even with the acrylic as a base, um, you can get some surface and texture. I actually really like the way this, the uh, edge of the acrylic comes through here. I don't know if you can see it. Um, it's a beautiful color too. That's cold steel. I am going to just show you a couple of things. This is a new series um, that I've been working on. Uh, they're called Messages and they're actually using um, ink, pigment sticks, uh, water and burning stuff. And I am now going to turn you over to my neat friend. <laughs> who's gonna show you some other things. And um, yeah. Very nice. Well, so. <laughs> Thanks. All right, so my demo will be anywhere as extensive as Lisa's. But, um, <laughs> I'll be bringing a lot of the same materials that, that she is, but um, my background's in textiles. So I have a different type of, we're both material girls. And we both love experimenting with materials. And so I'm gonna be bringing uh, a little bit different stuff, but as far as water media, since we are sort of um, focusing on water media, I'm gonna show you just a couple other ones that I'm gonna bring. So if you wanna spotlight my hands. Yeah. So these are some things that I found recently. They're called gelatos, which is pretty appropriate since we'll be in Italy, I think. Um, and they're made by uh, Faber-Castell. 
And they're, they're acrylic, but they're water soluble and they come in these really beautiful colors. Um, all these colors here is what they look like. But you can draw with them and they kind of remind me of the RNF um, pigment sticks because they're that real soft, almost lipsticky like um, consistency. They're real buttery when they go on. So you can draw with them. And then you can also smear them around with a little water. Some colors smear a little bit better than others, I've noticed. But you can really um, work with them in that way, which is kind of fun. And then you can draw in, you know, wet and wet too. So I think Lisa just said she just got some. So I was telling her about Amazon. Them. Amazon, yeah. And they don't have a huge color range. Um, and they do have a few metallics, but um, I bought every color I could find. So um, I'm gonna be bringing those and so is Lisa. Um, the other thing that I've been painting with lately, oh, here's a little, this was a little experiment with the um, gelatos. Oh. Just layering and layering. Um, they're really fun and they're quick. You know, you can do real gestural things with them and um, just work out some ideas really fast with those. Um, the other thing I've been working with lately are these Liquitex acrylic gouaches. I don't like shiny things. Um, you know, I don't like acrylic, you know, how it's got that plasticky feel sometimes. I don't really like that. So I've been just messing around with some of those and they just, they have that nice flat gouache, um, you know, appearance, the quality of the thing, which is nice, I like. So I'm gonna be bringing some of those. Uh, the other thing I always travel with is a little bit of stitching um, or crocheting, some sort of handcraft. This is a book I've been working on. Um, it's stitched. Oh. Um, and I did a book like this. The first time I went to Italy, I made a book like this and I stitched these little pages. So this is like an accordion book. It goes like that, sort of. Let's do one of those. Yeah, so I still have to put the back cover on. But um, so I'll bring some stitching. Um, you know, one of the things I like to do when I travel too is to scrounge materials. So we'll probably go on some scavenger hunts, see what we can find. Uh, this is cardboard. We might find some interesting Italian cardboard. I don't know. Um, but, you know, I paint it and then I make some shapes, some sculptures that are um, made out of painted cardboard that I hand stitch together. So we might experiment with that. We might stitch together some drawings, some of our paintings. This is one I just did as an example. You know, we might do collage on cardboard. Maybe some Things rusting. Like that. Maybe some rusting. rusting tea. <laughs> and, you know, this, the typical drawing materials, I like to, um, you know, like I said, my background's in textiles. I like to uh, look at architecture, look at walls, just do little sketches um, related to that kind of thing. So I think there's going to be, um, oh, another thing are these Neo colors, they're also water soluble. I've got a million of these. Um, so yeah, no shortage of materials that we're gonna be bringing. So that's about all I have. Well, so let's talk yeah. a little, let's just talk a little bit about what, what we've taught. Okay. So yeah, you go. Okay. So um, we, we taught a class last summer called Material Language Challenge. And it was about, um, we threw out a, a bunch of different materials for different people to do, do something with, you know? It, and it ranged from, oh, different kinds of foam and wood 
and you know straying and and all kinds of things and uh, some of the things people came away with you know it's more about process and experiment experimentation and uh it was it, that was a really fun class i think what um even though lisa and i's work we work very differently i think one of the things that connects us is that we we have similar similar affinities towards material and process and um, conceptual interests as well. So we did another class called Contemplative Practices where um, we, we kind of focused on processes that were meditative. So one of them was textiles like stitching, repetitive processes, knitting, crocheting, those kind of things. We did a segment on um, repetitive mark making. Um, another part was, um, I think we did collecting, how we collect things and what we collect, um, labyrinths, things like that, um, things in nature. Um, let's see what else. We did another class called visual record art as artifact. And that was more conceptually based on uh, one segment was on time and how do we how do we process and use time in our work, either actually physically or um, implied time. We looked at surfaces. We looked at memory. Um, we looked altars. at altars. Altars. We looked at um, books how um, their records of time, things like that. Um, so a lot of these things that we do, we, we, we like to pack in the conceptual aspect of, of our teaching because that's where we feel like it really, I mean, that's what, that's what it's about, you know, so. And at the moment we're in the middle of a 10 week, 10 week? <laughs> 10, yeah, week, 10. 10, 10 week class called Conquering Composition. So you can count on us to throw some of that in whenever we can. <laughs> yeah. Um, so we both have PowerPoints. I'm gonna show you mine and then Sue's gonna show hers. Okay, so <laughs> this is just a quick, well, I'll make it quick. Um, kind, you know, an idea about traveling. And um, my first experience of traveling was when I was 13. And um, my mother, my sister went to Hebrew University and my mother took me to Israel. And I really, when I look back, I really believe that that made me an artist because the contrast of everything there between, you know, culture, uh, old and old and new, uh, religion, um, everything about that place was so uh, mind boggling to me as a 13 year old. Um, I really, it, it was life changing. So, um, so this is um, my, when, my first trip to Italy, I actually didn't show a bunch of pictures, but this is the picture that I, I decided to show because I took a million pictures of laundry lines and uh, they ended up in my work um, in different ways. So this is an oil and, um, and actually pigment stick painting. And here's another one from the same time frame. And then another one. <laughs> So I really, those, those laundry lines uh, stayed with me for quite a while, even though they're pretty much abstracted, of course. Uh, this is a photo I took in, uh, yeah, it was in Italy. Um, and then a year or two later, I made this painting and I was going through my photos and I, I said, wow, you know, there, there is that kind of connection. So I, I really believe when you travel or even whenever you take photos, you've kind of, you use your composite, you know, you're being, you're capturing a moment of time that then gets distilled through um, and then comes out visually. Um, 
light to me is always something that I find fascinating. These are two photographs. And then um, in some of my work, you'll see these sort of window-esque um, shapes with the light and not knowing whether you're inside or outside um, kind of happens. Again, another photo, I think this was in um, New Mexico. So sometimes I don't know if my work influences my photos or my photo influences my work. Um, this is a photo, um, Robert Pilardi from Cuba. And I have, I had a book of his and I just was, went, you know, I was so inspired by the color. Um, again, photos that then um, get turned into work. Um, this was an uh, early encaustic piece. Uh, traveling, I taught in um, New York and I found just being on that train every day totally inspired a series of works of like motion and windows and train tracks and things like that. Um, and again, just draw in the car, moving, taking pictures of bridges and structures. And, and then here it comes, you know, kind of coming out in the work. Again, these are, these are encaustic pieces. And there's another photo. Um, I felt like that, that's an oil painting. Uh, again, another one of these where I took this photo and then I went in the studio a few days later, I made a painting, I put it up on the wall. I, I, I had, I was like, oh, you know, I was shocked that there was this idea there um, that continues um, boats or something that I use a lot in as a metaphor and as a shape. And then Taos. Um, Taos, New Mexico, right outside of the studio, you know, where, where all these mountains. And suddenly there I was making sort of a landscape idea that just popped out. So I, I definitely feel that I've really missed traveling um, a lot. And um, I'm really looking forward to it. Um, you know, I love all this, like when you go in, I was telling them I want to go to an art supply store. When you go into all these different kinds of stores and you take these kinds of pictures um, and the scarves in Mexico kind of refer to these groupings of paintings that um, I did. And then this painting is like from graduate school. And then I took that picture in France two years ago. It's like, okay. There's definitely a connection here. And again, some just a couple others. Color, composition, um, shapes, um, senses. Um, and that's my, those are some photos that I just took recently that are on my waiting to be discovered. How pretty, how nice. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> it's great to see the, uh, the, the interaction between the photo and the abstraction in the painting. It's really amazing because you really capture something that one wouldn't expect to be captured. You know, it's right, like and that's exactly what we, we both will be focusing on um, with the students. You know, so the iPhone will definitely be part of the part of the party. <laughs> Fantastic. Yeah. So do we have another PowerPoint, Susan? Yeah. <clears throat> so do you want to share or do you want to spotlight? Um, I can share. Let's see. Here we go. Wait, this one. All right. Let's see. So it's so similar to Lisa. I, um, you know, I take pictures everywhere I travel. And what I usually look at is um, I look at pattern a lot. 
I, I search out patterns. I look at color and I look at surfaces. Um, a lot of my work is inspired by textiles and textile processes. And, and part of that is because I feel that, um, you know, so much of, of textiles is part of all of our lives. You know, some of these processes have been handed down generation to generations for hundreds of years and haven't changed that much. And part of my, I don't know, dri what drives me to do some of these is that I feel like my involvement with them is like a language that I can speak to with people in other cultures. Um, and, and I like having that connection. I can, I can talk to people about what they're doing and, and all of that. So part of that is, is my attraction to it. So I took this photo um, in Java and um, again, not, you know, just as Lisa was saying, not intending to make a direct translation of what I've seen, but it, it's sort of you absorb it, you ingest it and, and somewhere in the back of your subconscious, um, it, it comes out in some form or another. This is where I was talking about the textiles and the um, he's applying wax to fabric here and then it's going to be dyed into indigo. And this is a piece I did after, after that. And again, you know, it's, this actually, this photo was taken after I did this piece. Mm. And sometimes it's, you know, the simplest thing of something protruding from a wall that might be stuck in the back of my mind and something like that would come out. Or it might be some sort of arrangement of objects on a wall that would lead to a series or a grouping of arrangements. <clears throat> this piece I did two years before I took this photo. So it is kind of interesting how these things go back and forth, you know, did the piece influence, just like Lisa was saying, did the piece, piece influence the photograph or did the photograph influence the piece? You know, I was looking through some photos last night and I found this and it really resonated with a painting that I did, you know, a couple of years ago. And it's, I find it, it's, it's really interesting to go back through because I don't usually use photos as any kind of reference, but it is the experience, you know, and the recording of the experience that I feel comes out in the work. This is in Bali. Oh. And this was a series of um, sculptures that I did that um, were, I call them reliquaries, sort of these sacred um, objects. How large are they? That one is about, I think it's about 15 inches. That last one was a little taller, maybe two feet. Does it, uh, it just looks so much like a dreidel. <laughs> <laughs> it does. Oh, that's true. That's true. It does. Yeah. It's beautiful. This is in um, Java, Borbadur Temple. And um, these are, there's a life-size Buddha in each of these. There's hundreds of them on this temple. So I like that mystery of what, what's contained and what you can't see. Uh, this is in India and um, I, I'm really interested in this connection between architecture and textile and how you know they're both based on grids and they're both 
uh, sources of shelter and comfort and um, started this series with cardboard and stitching cardboard together like sort of like quilts but um, I also think of them as walls. And kind of really these are just, you know pictures of a picture of slums in um, India, but just the resourcefulness of material and the patchwork of how you put your house together and, and everything I just found, I found it to be very beautiful actually. Which kind of led to these pieces. This is one photograph that I actually had in mind when I created the next piece. I just love this blue and this idea of this big blue wall. And, oh man, nobody ever calls me this much. <laughs> I even have it on silent. Um, anyway, I just love this big blue wall. And so I um, made this piece. It's a pretty large piece. I think it's 80. 87 inches wide and um, it also reminded me when I was doing it is that I had a blanket my favorite blanket was this color um, as a child and so I called this piece uh, big blue comfort oh. whoops skipped this is just a wall in Brooklyn And a piece that came after that. This is that uh, art store in Rome. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. We might have to go there. Uh -huh. uh, I came home with a bunch of these pigments too. Um, but, you know, just color sometimes is inspiration. These uh, pieces were made along in the same time period, I was doing the flat wall pieces too and the cardboard. And um, the idea behind these was that, you know, they were um, containers, you know, I'm kind of drawing on my own personal history and personal memories of sewing with my grandmother and stitching with some um, women in India and how, how textiles in and of themselves become containers of memory. And um, that's kind of what this series was about. And that's it. Wow. There's uh, a lot of, uh, do, you, do you appreciate the architecture of Frank Gehry? Oh, yeah. <laughs> we were just looking at him in our class today. <laughs> really? <laughs> yeah. Amazing. We were looking at his drawings, actually. Yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, his drawings are wonderful. Wow, wow, yeah. that work is great. That's that's um, uh, they seem to be. You are showing us the jump from you know from from the place from which you jump uh, into your final what you have decided what you have been you know inspired to create, but those jump off points are so amazing and I think kind of universal. Like it's going to be, one doesn't have to be an abstract painter to get an incredible amount of info, not just about the material, from the materials, but also from what is inspiring you. It's, it's, uh, it's really moving. I really appreciate that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank you. Do you want yeah. to, uh, I wanted to open it up and uh, maybe get a couple of comments and then one of the things we're trying to do here is get these two teachers to ask people who have been to La Romita a couple of questions about La Romita. So does anyone want to uh, comment on what we've seen now? Let's try not to all at the, the same time, but I think we can keep it under control. Uh, I have a question. If, if you have these <clears throat> exotic uh, media, is it to come? How do they they use your 
material or do they yeah, have yeah. to bring it? Yeah. Well, there there would be a materials suggestion list and then, yeah. you know. And then we'll scrounge. <laughs> yeah, you know, we'll, we'll, we all work it out one way or another. Yeah. You know, if we don't have what we need, we'll use what we have, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And well, it appears that you can use anything. Exactly. It's very Yeah. Nice. And, and wheels. Or dirt. Love you to work with dirt. Yeah. <laughs> Sticks and stones and, uh, and grape uh, juice. Twigs and. Yeah. 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 Tell yeah us. Why not? Mm -hmm. the, uh, so we also, uh, we usually will interact with the teachers long before they show up and anything we can get to make it easier uh, while we're in Italy. Most most of these things, like for example, I, I, some of the companies that you were representing that you did like um, Faber Castell, that's a German company. I mean, there are a lot of these things are available in, in Europe, so. Yeah, I think Derwin is in Europe too. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I have a couple of questions. I want to know the nitty gritty. So this is in July 22. No, we don't have a an actual time of the year yet that's in 22. And we are talking, we first were talking about the fall, but now we're talking about spring. And we're thinking of mi about maybe the last week of April, first week of May around there. When the days are long and the weather is beautiful. So so how do you sign up and how much? <laughs> well, let's, let's, let's let Alessandro handle this because uh, we are, we're, you know, this is uh, 2022 is being formed fabulous. right before I your eyes. <laughs> Ruth is in. Yeah. <laughs> Great. Way to, way to put me on the spot, Edmund. Thank you so yeah, much. Yeah, there you go. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, as, as far as registration, uh, there will be ways to register on our website. Uh, obviously, we're still organizing the workshop. So when we've got everything kind of settled down and we know exactly what we're doing, uh, we'll try and have, uh, our, we try to publish our, our season in about August. Um, okay. If we have this ready before then, we'll, we'll, we'll put it up there before. And what you can do in the meantime is you can <laughs> send our send emails and say, you know, I'm really interested in this and I've told my friends and they're gonna, you know, they wanna come too and that, that sort of stuff, that, that, that helps uh, keep the pressure on us to get it out to you. Uh, as, far okay. as, uh, as far as the price, um, the, uh, that also is something that we start looking at you know, it, it, at this time frame because we're trying to figure out what, what things are gonna be like and, and how much it'll have to, you know, we'll, we'll charge. The, the thing that I like to stress yeah. is that, you know, the, the price will be somewhere, depending on how long the workshop is, it'll be somewhere in the 3,500. But the thing to remember on that is that's, you're getting all inclusive of, uh, we, we pick you up at the airport, all your meals, all your room, all your board, all your day trips, that is, is all included uh, in, in that price, so. Um, is that double occupancy or do, or do you have singles? Uh, we have singles and the occupancy is one of those particular things that we're looking at right now because of, uh, you know, the situations of the past year. Uh, so, yeah, sure. But we do have single rooms. We do have double rooms. We have the opportunity to have a double room as a single person. We'll, we'll, we'll have we have that information generally on our website. And you can always ask a question. And they can right now, Sandro, can't they um, go there and sign up that they're interested in Lisa and Susan's for 2022? You're muted, Sandra. Yeah, I, uh, let me double check that, but I, I believe so, yes. I was going to ask, um, this, uh, this is, uh, by the way, Harold Benson is one of our participants and Her uh, Harold, we call him Ben, um, was married to Enza Cornelli, the founder of La Romita for 50 something years. And uh, uh, Enza passed away a couple of years ago, but Ben is an architect and has been a professor of architecture. And I thought he would be uh, interested in Sue's kind of architectural work. Did that not mind remind you of Frank Gehry, Ben? 
No, no, it does. I, I think this <laughs> idea of patterns, you're correct. Uh, textiles and buildings are very similar. Mm. Also, oh. Gary's house in LA. Mm. Is it a nice oh, place? Use materials oh. like that. That's, this is wonderful. So I want, please, Susan, Lisa, please ask a question of people who have been to La Ramita before. We got a lot of alumni here. Oh, good. I want to know your favorite side trips. Yeah. Who's got a favorite town? Penelope or? I will say, uh, so I've been to La Ramita twice and the second time, which was in 2019, the town, Edmund, you'll have to help me how to say it, the, the weaving town with the water that goes all the way. Raspinia? Rasilia. Rasilia. I wish we had spent a whole day there. Even if We're I just discovering that town. You realize that yes, this is the first time we took a group there. And it just is, it is so magnificent because um, because of all that water that runs through the town, which makes it very different than and than so many of the other other towns, I'd say I'd put that up as um, one of my many favorites. <laughs> the uh, the town of Rasilia that she's talking about, um, actually, they built they had a, a spring. Uh, and rather than build on the sides of this spring going down toward a down a hillside toward a river, they just built the houses in the middle of the spring. And so the spring is all over the town. It's just wow. amazing. It's and in terms of textiles, they do, it, it, it has a history of textiles and there's right. some beautiful looms that are still set up. I don't know that they're operational, but they do oh. have a festival uh, yeah. devoted to weaving and Penelope. Oh, and wow. that. <laughs> Neil would really like that. <laughs> <laughs> that sounds great. We have two looms. Who else has a uh, favorite? I think. Let's ask the Italian here. Valerio is is yet at La Romita at this moment. It's almost yeah. midnight there, or after midnight. What's yeah, What's mid your favorite town? Being from Umbria, Valerio, do you have a favorite? <sighs> um, yeah, Rasilia and also Spoleto. It's magical. Spoleto is Spoleto beautiful. is famous for the art, the festival. Spoleto has a historical festival about every kind of art, from theater to dance to painting. Everything was, I mean, there. Um, now, I think from the 60s, of the 50s, the festival de Duemonde, de Duemondi, was very yeah, famous. I, I believe it's it started like four years before La Romita did. Yeah, yeah. La, La so, Romita started in 66, and I think it started in 62 or something. Yeah. So no, Spoleto, it's mentioned before the Drun arts. Stroncone. Huh? They were almost at the same time. What? Yeah. Stroncone, um, Stroncone. I was saying. I really love that one, because it just <laughs> is on the side of the hill, and you you can just sort of wander in into it, and then back and forth inside. It's It's just like... It's something nice on the outside, but then there are all kinds of treasures on the inside. Definitely, mm -hmm. including they have a collection of um, early medieval choral illustrated manuscripts that they like mm -hmm. to show to us we, when we visit. That's right. Oh, nice. Absolutely beautiful. And Stronconi, the, some of the towns they're talking about here are Stronconi is actually like 10 kilometers from La Romita. Yeah, it's it's so, so it's, near, you're, 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 uh, you are you have a lot of time because you you can, uh, you, you land there and then, then there's also a, a neat bar at the, uh, at the, at the bottom. Yeah. And, and you can, you can just sketch the old men. They're just, <laughs> they're just, they're just fun. Oh, the, there's all kinds of things there. I love it. What about the what, I'm going to sh what was that, Judy? Buddha, if you want to go for pottery. 
Oh, oh Deruta. 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 Definitely. Oh, oh hi, Judy. Good to see you. <laughs> um, yeah, Deruta is very close. That's about 40 minutes away and home of the, well, one of the, one of the centers for Maiolica ceramics in Italy and a, a really pretty mm -hmm. town as well. I was in La, La Ramita I, six times. Six I, times. Yeah, I've kept <laughs> We can't. I want to try to just uh, share my screen for one second because um, is it being shared, Valerio? Yeah. Yes. This is what Rasilia looks like. Yes. Oh, oh wow. Oh, that's interesting. Wow. Yeah. That's amazing. And the river just runs right through the middle of the town. Oh, yeah. Whoa. Isn't that amazing? I wonder if they have uh, mold in their, ba no basement, but in their home. They <laughs> definitely have mold. <laughs> that's without a doubt. Without oh, yeah. A doubt. So I think we're a, we're a, yeah we're a bit over. Well, that that's really fascinating. Gosh, Sue and Lisa, I can't wait. This is going to be really fun. And so please, everybody, stay stay in touch. And Sandra, we did find that there is a a sign up for more information about Susan and Lisa. Yes, so, on the website, if you go into the the workshops menu, there's something a line for 22 and beyond. And there's a form that you can just leave your uh, email address with. Um, and you keep you in the loop, so you'll be first to know when when things get settled. Great. Okay. Thank you. Thank you all. This is thank you. Thank you. This was great. Fun. Thank you. Thanks so much. Thanks, Lisa. Thanks, Lisa. Thanks, Lisa. Thanks, Susan. We'll, we'll continue our discussion and we'll be in touch very soon. Thanks so much for the presentation. It was beautiful. Thank you. Thank Bye. you. Bye everyone. Bye, Bye everyone. Bye.